Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Sridhar Sivasubu and I am from the Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, Delhi. Uh, today I am going to talk about a very interesting topic which is very pertinent to the um, discussion and the con meeting that we are having on rare diseases. This is how to use a model organism for understanding rare diseases and I have titled my talk aptly as a personal fish for every human. And towards the, I divided my talk into three parts. The first part will talk about the genomics of a very interesting model organism called zebrafish. And the second part is how do we use human genomic information and integrate it with the model organism. And third is how to make sense of all this. And this completes the, compl the story of um, how to use zebrafish for personalizing of a model for every rare disease that we come across. So before I go on to the zebrafish, let me introduce my lab. The mission of my lab is to actually use zebrafish to dissect molecular mechanism of gene function, regulation and organization in vertebrates. Largely, the lab works on two major themes. One is to understand molecular mechanisms underlying non-protein coding RNA mediated regulation of vascular development and the second half of my lab actually deals with zebrafish models for rare genetic disorders and towards personalizing and precision medicine in humans and this is the second objective is what I'm going to be really concentrating today upon during this talk. Zebrafish is largely a fish that's found in the Indian subcontinent and it's, it can be rightly said it was an Indian import to the West. It's a small hobby fish which was first brought into the realms of the laboratory by uh, a scientist called Streisinger um, at the University of Oregon who used it as a pet fish and identified that this fish could really be used to teach biology and that's when it entered into the realm of uh, scientific laboratories and since then it has taken great strides and has uh, laid down some, some of the important discoveries that we know in biology, uh, rather in developmental biology. But the most striking example of how it was used for human biology comes from the study uh, done in Keith Cheng's lab, um, as shown in my slide, where um, uh, the researchers really show that how a single point mutation in the human genome could give rise from the dark pigmented African ancestry to the light pigmented European ancestry and this was aptly modeled in zebrafish and came out in the cover of the science which I like to really show the power of the model organism and, and to show how you could model human uh, processes using zebrafish. You could, similarly you could model several such protein coding genes. Another example is of um, a, a pigment uh, gene that I have personally worked on uh, along with my colleagues uh, during my postdoc uh, where we modeled um, ocular cutaneous albinism in humans. As you can see the um, uh, animals that lack the gene actually have very less pigmentation compared to the wild type. Not only this, not only the protein coding RNA are very conserved in, in their function also, non-protein coding RNA is also very conserved in zebrafish as shown by my, the other example of microRNA 142, uh, 3P, which is conserved across evolution. And a couple of years ago, uh, Mukesh, a senior graduate student in my lab, along with Vinod Skaria, my collaborator, actually showed that how this protein non-protein coding RNA could actually regulate uh, vascular integrity in zebrafish. So, this all leads to one single conclusion is that how are we able to do all this modeling? It's only because that we really are fish. The humans really incorporate some amount of fish in us. And that was very aptly described by one bear in his law that in spite of the 400 million years of evolutionary distance between fish and human, we actually have a conserved set of processes about 25,000 protein coding genes, a conserved set of non-coding RNAs, 
and vertebrate specific biological process, all of this are completely conserved and that allows us to do this modeling between humans and zebrafish. So, just to recap, why do you use zebrafish as a model organism? Primarily, it is used as a model organism because it is optically clear and has external developing embryos. Large number of embryos are laid by a single pair of um, male and female animals. The embryogenesis is pretty rapid and completed in about two days time. Most of the organ systems are formed within that two day period. It has a compact genome size. The genome is actually about half of the human genome and the most important is that it has a lot of genomic tools that can be has been developed over the years and the sequence of the laboratory strain and the wild strain are both available. So here is an example of how a zebrafish lab looks like. Primarily um, the, the example of the CSR IJB zebrafish laboratory. You have thousands of animals that you can uh, harbor in a facility such as this and the, you actually use this fish for doing all your biology. So now going on to the first story um, that I would like to present is uh, zebrafish not only is a fantastic model organism but there is one more unique property of zebrafish that actually is a non-isogenic model organism. So compared to most model organisms such as uh, mouse or rats which have isogenic lines, okay, that means they are clonal populations of each other. Zebrafish represents a model organism that is actually non-isogenic. That means they are not identical to each other in the genetic makeup. They are more like humans. So this slide of mine here really shows that why it is important to study wild populations of zebrafish because they do represent more closer to humans in their genetic makeup, in the diversity that they represent. And not only that, from a scientific perspective, it is important to understand that uh, these, uh, since zebrafish are maintained as outbred populations and have genetic diversity well conserved both in individual and population level, they do provide us a tremendous opportunity to study the expressivity of a gene, its penetrance that is contributed by natural genetic variation. It also allows us to study the phenotypic variability in human monogenic diseases. And that led us to the uh, sequencing of the uh, whole genome of a wild type strain of zebrafish a few years ago. And this study was initiated in my lab by a very brilliant graduate student called Ashok and uh, Ramya along with uh, Vinod's lab where we actually um, uh, attempted to sequence a whole genome of a wild type strain of zebrafish. By sequencing the uh, genome of the um, uh, wild type zebrafish at very high coverages, we were successful in identifying over 5 million single nucleotide variation and over 1.7 million insertion deletion uh, in this single wild animal. So what it tells us is that this model organism which is not only um, non-isogenic actually has a diversity which is um, equal to humans if not more than humans. This was important. I will show you why it is important towards the later part of my um, talk. Uh, but we, we also really looked at enrichment and we found that there was very selective enrichment of variations in genes associated with immunological functions. Yeah, well, it would be because this animal is in the wild, it is exposed to a lot of insults and pathogens. So definitely the immunological genes had to be um, uh, under selection pressure. But what importantly came out of uh, this study was that the human disease gene orthologs in zebrafish do not have an enrichment for variations. In other words, while the fish does have a lot of variations, but the disease genes, the human disease genes are pretty much not selected for, rather they are conserved very nicely. So it is a fantastic model organism to look to study human diseases while having a variation as much as humans would have. So it provided us the best of two worlds, one the background variations that one would need and the conservation of human disease genes. So uh, this led us to this marvelous publication uh, a couple of years ago 
where we demonstrated how the wild zebrafish was a fantastic resource for um, human bi disease biology. So while we were busy with the zebrafish genome, the human genomics, the world around the human genomics was exploding with this new the tool that was being um, applied extensively called the next generation sequencing. So one thing that was rapidly happening was the cost per base sequencing was rapidly falling down and this led to large number of human genomes being sequenced. So major advanced um, countries such as um, the United States, China, um, Great Britain um, and several of them actually sequenced individual um, representative members of their country and so th there began the era of personal genome sequencing. We had genomes of great people, great scientists like um, uh, Watson, Craig Venter uh, and several other notable figures being deposited in the public domain. So while these were happening, if you really looked at where were these genomes coming from, these genomes were largely coming from populations that were pretty much uniform or for example the, the, the Venter and the Watson genomes um, came out of the Caucasian um, populations, the Chinese, the Koreans and the Japanese genomes were mostly from um, the East Asian um, um, populations. Whereas the large part of diversity of human diversity actually is in the Middle East and the Central and Southeast Asia and there was hardly any representation from our part of the world. So therefore at that point um, we collaborated with several labs at IGIB uh, to actually document the first um, human genome from our country and not only that we also helped countries uh, such as Malaysia, Sri Lanka to uh, document the first human genomes and this allowed us a fantastic training ground to, to systematically analyze and functionally annotate variations in genomes of individuals. So now I'm going to shift my story having told you two stories one about the zebrafish genome and about the uh, our experience with the human genome I'm going to move on to a completely different story. How do we actually merge these two um, stories? And this has a, a very interesting um, incident that comes to my mind. This was after the day that we had announced the human genome from uh, India. I got a strange phone call from an individual uh, whom I refer to as the Bhai. This individual kept on saying that his family had suffered from a disease but couldn't really explain beyond that but upon further investigation we really found that his family had a, um, a genetic disease was running in his family and we got more interested in, and then we characterized this uh, genetic disease. I have several of my colleagues who will present stories about how we went ahead and characterized this genetic disease but most importantly it led to the genesis of the next part of my story which is called the rare genetic diseases or how we use genomics to understand rare genetic diseases. It led to the formulation of a project called the Guardian and it is called Genomics for Understanding Rare Diseases India Alliance Network. The reason why we started this story was one because we were really pushed hard by this individual to uh, study his family. That was one reason. The second reason while we were studying his family we realized that India is actually a melting pot of civilizations and it has unique genetic architecture characterized by small endogamous groups. So this provides us with an excellent opportunity to understand rare genetic diseases, most of which is undiagnosed of course. And this not only allows us to find new genes, new variations and pathways, but actually presents us with a fantastic pl platform to develop affordable genetic screens. This led us to formulation of a um, program called the Genomics for Understanding Rare Diseases India Alliance Network. So as part of this um, program called Guardian, which is 
between large number of collaborators in India, mostly consisting of clinicians. So we have clinicians referring patients to us with rare genetic disorders. These patients actually undergo a, a very defined set of um, examinations in the clinics and then their blood sample is subjected to a, a defined pipeline called the guardian pipeline wherein we sequence their exomes, analyze it to generate uh, reports. So these reports are rather more, more of scientific in nature than of diagnostic which eventually goes back to the doctors for counseling the patients. But while this happens, there's something interesting happens behind the, um, the doctor's clinic. That is actually, we take these variations, most of which are novel variations, and try to model them in zebrafish. Okay? Because we, many of, since these are novel variations, really you have to implicate them in the disease process. And this process is called functional validation. And this is why we bring in zebrafish. Now let me take you back to the first stories that I told. One, you know the background variations that exist in zebrafish. You know how to sequence the whole human genome or parts of the human genome. Now this is where we put it together in this program where we actually model the human variations back into zebrafish and try to functionally validate them. So, in order to do that, there are several mechanisms and I'm going to describe one such mechanism that has been widely now been tested and not yet used in uh, large scale settings but in very defined settings this has been uh, tested out and this has to, this technique is called genome editing this technique was pioneered by one of our collaborators dr stephen acker and his group and basically you use talents which are known to um, cause edit genomes by double standard breaks and you could use these talents to actually very precisely modify genomes. One could also use CRISPR's CAS systems, which are now becoming extremely popular to edit genomes. And once you edit a loci, you could, you could actually go back and see what sort of phenotype it causes in fish. Therefore, you have a disease model readily available to you. And you can use this disease model fish to either eliminate the gene function, report gene function, or alter gene function. Once you have these uh, models available, you could actually use those models to understand mechanism of a disease, make it specific to understanding a disease that a patient has. And finally, once we have understood the disease mechanism, we can actually attempt to screen through several chemical molecules in an attempt to find a molecule that could partially if not fully emulate the phenotype and thereby offering a hope to the patient that someday they could have a chemical molecule and in this case we plan to screen FDA approved drugs so which can directly go back into the clinics and therefore have a molecule for the patient uh, in a very defined clinically relevant time scale. So this, this concept was very elegantly put forth by my um, collaborator Dr. Stephen Ecker in a model called disease in a fish. So finally what I would like to summarize my talk saying that yes one could do human genomes or parts of genomes such as exome sequencing to understand the, the variations in the human genomes in this case patient samples come back with those variations, engineer those variations using genome editing tools into model organisms such as zebrafish, create the models, use those models to understand the disease mechanism and use those models again to screen for potentially mole potential molecules that could ameliorate the phenotype and take it back into clinics. So in summary, I hope I have convinced you that in the near future, one would actually have a personal fish for every rare disease that is going to be characterized. So fish is not just a fish, it's actually a hope. 
It's a hope for a family. It's hope for a person suffering from a rare disease. And that was actually what the title of my talk was. A personal fish for every human being who suffers from a rare disease. All the work that I've spoken today would not have been possible without that help and active and fantastic work being done by all the students in our lab, my former students, collaborators, Vinod and Steve Ecker, and of course, it would not have been possible without the excellent funding from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research India through a large number of grants over the last, uh, over the last few years that they have given us. Thank you.